Welcome back to those who have joined us for previous sessions and uh, good to have new viewers with us. As uh, we action towards truth and reconciliation, I've included a step of considering our webinar content through an indigenous lens and would share here that, for example, within AI, there can be a bias towards individualistic or self-serving results, whereas an indigenous way of thinking might prioritize a community benefit something to think about. Uh, you can see more at the Abundant Intelligences Project. For those who don't mean, know me, I am Teresa Beanken, CEO of National Speakers Bureau Canada and Global Speakers Agency. We're one of the original bureaus in North America, and we envision that the sharing of ideas inspires action to make the world a better place through bringing you our expert speakers and thought leaders for your conferences, training programs, and events, whether they be in person, online, or hybrid. I'm pleased to introduce today's speaker. I first met Rami Nassar on the recommendation of another of our speakers, and this was BC before COVID. Uh, I was fascinated by his insights on artificial intelligence and the need for an ethical approach. Uh, he seemed ahead of the curve, and as many of our clients weren't quite ready for the topic as yet, However, with the explosion of AI and ChatGPT of late and more, especially prioritizing innovation, has become a topic too fast moving to ignore. His skills include that of being the head of innovation at Mattel, pioneering experiences aimed at growing the Barbie and Hot Wheels brands with a foresight mindset. He's also helped organizations like TD, Apple, Air Canada, TELUS, and more. Welcome, Rami. Thank you, Teresa. So uh, I thought I would warm up with this quote that comes to me all the time, uh, it's fairly recent, but this notion of AI being no longer an option, I guess. By the end of the decade, there will be two kinds of companies, those who use AI and those who are out of business. And this comes from a certainly a very forward-looking individual, Peter Diamantis, who founded the uh, X-Files Foundation, uh, wrote a book called Abundance, and is a venture capitalist uh, based in the Valley. But I often reflect back on this notion that this is one of the landmark changes of certainly our generation up there with the advent of the internet and our ability to connect with one another around the world. And I think we are just at the earliest stage of that inflection point. And so with that, as I was putting this together for today, trying to think about a theme and introduce some of the different topics I'm passionate about and that I uh, tend to speak on and lead workshops on. I had this feeling around this idea of AI now, next, and never. And how do we incorporate this notion of strategic foresight, which I'll expand on what that is uh, briefly, and how we use that in working with emerging technology, not just AI, but all forms of emerging technology. So uh, as was mentioned, uh, because we're all virtual and we've kind of gotten used to this virtual world, I love to do my best to try to make things interactive, even if it is being delivered over Zoom. And we've got unbelievable technologies for that. So if you've got a, one of these rectangles, aka a smartphone, uh, I call them rectangles for no real particular reason at all. Um, you can scan that QR code. Uh, a link is also directly in the chat window of Zoom. And on top of that, you can go to menti.com and put in that eight number code. You'll see that code at the top of almost every slide in case you're someone's joining late or you forgot. You can do it from a phone or a browser window. It doesn't really matter. And it just gives you an opportunity to weigh in. And in a few points, we'll, we'll do some polls. And I find them just really interesting ways to, to get input from the whole group and let you also see how does your perspective on a topic compare to that of your peers. So with that, I should probably introduce myself. I'm Remy, it's nice to meet you all. Um, I wish we were in person, but we live in a, this hybrid world now, but I do love getting the opportunity again after many years, not uh, traveling around Canada, around North America, around the world, uh, giving presentations. Uh, I run a company called Thousand Days Out, that's our consultancy, small team, and we work on areas of foresight and uh, emerging technology strategy. I uh, am a father. I've got an 11-year-old and a one-and-a-half-year-old. Keeps me on my toes. Uh, husband and uh, hopefully uh, mutually a best friend. In 
in what feels like it was a past life, uh, I had the unique opportunity to, to build the innovation practice at Mattel. So the corporate innovation practice, including launching Mattel's first and now one of several innovation labs. My lab was focused on retail strategy. And basically I lived and breathed and ate Barbies and Hot Wheels and uh, Fisher Price toys for, for a number of years. But what it allowed me to do was get some of those real world war wounds and scars that go along with corporate innovation and go along with taking concepts and ideas into production, into commercialization, and all of the additional challenges that go with that beyond having a great idea and having a team to build it. Uh, I teach at uh, too many universities right now to list, but uh, a number of universities in Canada, uh, a technical university in Norway of all places where I teach the what at the time was the first uh, course on AI and design thinking in the world. There's a few now, but we've been doing that for four years now and a university in the US as well. I love teaching. I think of presenting as a big part of my my teaching aspirations and passion. Uh, and then uh, worked on a book and working on a new book now as well on corporate innovation. Uh, so that's a little bit about me. And this is a little bit about what I'm excited about and what I want to share with you today. There's sort of three topics, but they're all going to sort of fall under that notion of AI now, next, and never. So the first one to ground ourselves in is this idea of strategic foresight. And I'll speak more about what that is. Sometimes I'll call it futurism. I might go back and forth or futures thinking, but that's the first one. The second is AI and emerging technology. And I tend to group those together because I want us to be thinking with that longer term lens, always as business leaders, not just what are the capabilities of today, but what do they look like tomorrow? What are the responsible use and ethical considerations? Where is it all headed? And then the third one, which might initially seem kind of disconnected here is innovation management or corporate innovation, but it's not. Because in order to bring new AI and technology forward solutions into production, into commercialization, we need to really understand how corporate innovation works. And as mentioned, I, I did more than just dip my toes into that world, uh, both with uh, Mattel and then later on with Cadillac Fairview uh, leading innovation practices. So this is your first chance now to weigh in. So if you have Mentimeter open, the logos, uh, the link is at the top of the screen and in the chat. I would love to know from a few of you or anyone who would want to, what words or couple of words that might come to mind when I use the word futurism, futures thinking, or strategic foresight. And then as we kind of see how everyone else thinks about it, It'll be, uh, I'll go from there and I'll tell you my non-academic, non-approved definition of strategic foresight and the way I think about it. So I'll give everyone about 20 seconds here to throw a few words in. Vision, innovation, planning, evolution. I really like that word there. Oh, someone wrote predicting the future. I'm going to have some fun on that exact topic anticipating the future, anticipation. So very different than predicting. And we'll talk about that in a second. Really interesting to see those different, similar but different words. Give it a couple more seconds here if there's any other ones. New vision. I love, love the word readiness there because that's a big part of how I look at this world. And by the way, um, post-webinar, We'll export these slides, including the outcomes, even if you add your words a little bit later on, uh, so you have an access to, to all the slides I go through, including the outcomes of sort of the group polls. So why don't I give you my definition? We'll talk for a moment about some of the words that, that you all shared here. Simply put, I think of foresight and futures thinking as the art and science of resilience to change. If you asked me, what is foresight not? I'd say it's not predicting the future. None of us can really predict what's going to happen. There's all kinds of things that would be different in the world if any of us had this capability. But I do think we can anticipate the need for change and the need for resilience to change. The reason I call it art and science is because a lot of it comes from practice and there's a gut instinctive nature to it. But there are tools and processes we can use 
to do this systematically within organizations, within teams, uh, within boards of directors. So we are trying to anticipate, for example, the future needs of our customers. I'm always torn whether or not to use the Gretzky quote about, you know, go where the uh, work where the puck is going. And I, I tend to usually butcher it a bit anyway, but we're trying to think about what will our customer, our users, our stakeholders, our shareholders of the future need? And how do we design products, services, systems, and platforms to anticipate those needs? As we think about innovation, we also, again, want to be thinking about where are the opportunities in terms of where the market dynamics are going? not just where's technology today, what are our customers demanding today. That is very kind of current state thinking. Foresight and futures thinking says, how do we systematically and structurally think about where things are headed? And probably most importantly, it is a strategy to mitigate against long-term risks. The only thing we know for certain is that things are always going to change. COVID is a cliche, but very valuable and, and simple example of the importance of foresight, of preparation. That's why I like the word readiness in that word cloud that we did. So as I think about foresight, I always come back to this idea of resilience. How do we build teams, product roadmaps, organizations, or leadership structures that are resilient to change? One of the ways we do it is with this character. And if we were in person, I'd ask you to put your hands up and try to guess who this is, uh, but I will spoil it for you. This is a Roman god named Janus. And bear with me for a second, this is going somewhere. Roman mythology celebrated and, and, and worshiped and idolized many different gods. Janus was one of the most interesting ones to me personally and professionally. Janus was the god of doors and gates. You might be wondering, in a world where you think of Roman or Greek mythology, you think of the god of thunder and god of war and god of the sun, why would there be a god of doors? Well, doors in Roman mythology represented much, much more than an entry or an exit. They represented the duality of man. Janus, in fact, was visually depicted, as you can see here, as the two-faced god. So Janus was believed to be able to see both forward into the future and also back into the past. And your fun, completely useless cocktail party fact of the day that you can, not, you can tell people over dinner or the next party you go to, the month of January is actually so named after Janus. Jan January would be the month where we can look forward to the year that's about to begin or backward to the year that just finished. So if you take nothing away from today, you've got a fun fact to uh, impress uh, or annoy your friends with. The reason I'm fascinated by Janus is Janus led to someone much, much smarter than me developing a tool for foresight, an exercise called a Janus cone. And this is an example of a completed Janus cone that I ran with a group of uh, individuals from a, a range of different organizations, all looking at employee wellness and employee well-being. This was done in, you might be able to notice here in 2022, so kind of on the tail end of COVID, where the role of employee wellness inside of mid-sized and large organizations had completely changed. The objective was to think about where is this part of an organization strategy going? But what I have found and what's been proven over and over again is the most effective way to think about where the future is going is to think about where we came from. So a big part of this Janus Cone exercise is to look back at key milestones, events, um, forces, trends that have occurred over the last 5, 10, 15, maybe even 20 years, and then extrapolate key themes. And the exercise is interesting because the first few minutes when people participate, it's always a little awkward. People kind of feel, why are we doing this? Why do I care about what happened 20 years ago? But Within about 10 minutes of an exercise like this, it's unbelievable watching people pull out themes and almost start to be able to predict. And again, I, I'm very cautious on using that word, but anticipate what trends and forces might impact them in their role in the coming years. So it's one example of how we can bring a structured approach to something that feels very hard to grasp, right? How do we think about the future? We use tools like this, and there are many others, but this is one of my favorites. 
So switching gears a little bit, let's let's talk a bit about AI. And I cannot think about AI, especially with a foresight mindset, without thinking about this book, which I read earlier this year. Uh, one of my favorite authors, uh, educator and astrophysicist, uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson. I'm sure many of you are familiar with him. Wrote this book. It actually has very little to do with astrophysics. Um, but there's one part of the book that really stuck with me. He proposes this idea that every 30 years, roughly every generation, the world is unrecognizable and technology being a big part of what causes that. And so if you think about that example for just a second, if you were to take someone from 30 years ago, from 1993, and bring them to the world of today, even right this instant, they would have no clue what we are doing. We are looking at laptops, which were just starting to come online, but there was no real global universal access to the internet. We did not have smartphones. We barely had cell phones. And the idea of working in a webinar with 50 people from across an entire continent, all in real time, would be science fiction to them. This notion of the world being unrecognizable gives us a good grounding for how change happens. And so if I think about that in context of AI, the only way I can think about what excites me about AI is by going back in time a little bit, sort of where are we at now, to really think about where we're headed in the future. So if you bear with me, let's think about what happened in 1997. There's four interesting things to me that happened in 1997, which three are kind of fun facts. And the, the fourth is, uh, is the one I really want to focus on. First of all, George Clooney, we all love him. Time Magazine Person of the Year. Well-deserved, I'm sure. Uh, the first Harry Potter book was published in 1997. Now J.K. Rowling's wealthier than the entire royal family uh, combined. Titanic sailed into movie theaters and sailed into our hearts. We all saw it. We all loved it. Let's not pretend. But probably most interestingly, at least to uh, an AI and technology nerd like me, this game of chess happened. This was Gary Kasparov playing against IBM's supercomputer. You can see there's a person there from IBM doing the moves that the computer tells him to do. And he ultimately lost. Gary Kasparov at the time was the highest rated chess player, grandmaster in chess in the world. And it was the first time a computer had defeated the world's best chess player. At the time, we thought it was a major big deal. I'm going to quickly try to convince you it wasn't. And the reason it wasn't was because the computer used brute force. There was so much computing power that the algorithm could calculate 24 moves into the future, every possible state of the board, 24 moves into the future, and then choose the move that is most advantageous. This happened nearly 30 years ago, over 25 years ago now. If we fast forward just 20 years, we get this really cool visual and literal and, and metaphorical mirror image. In 2018, Lee Sedol, the world's highest rated Go player, played against Google's algorithm called AlphaGo, and he lost. It took 21 years to go from a computer that could beat the world's best chess player to a computer that could build, beat the world's best Go player. And here's why. In the game of Go, there is 10 to the 170. If you don't remember your scientific notation, that's a one with 170 zeros behind it. Too many zeros for me to even fit them on the slide. States that the board can be in. For context, there is only 10 to the 80 atoms in the entire known universe. It is an uncomprehensible, complicated game. And it's mostly because the board is bigger. So where our AI journey has gone in those last 20 years, and this was in 2018, was to this idea of deep learning. You've probably heard the term before. Deep learning is the notional concept of algorithms and computers that think the way we do. They are inspired and designed similar, not identical to, but similar to our biology based on neural networks. And so the algorithm learns from other players' games and develops new strategies, in fact, strategies that no human had ever developed on their own before. If we're in our time machine, we only have to go one more hop five years into the future, 2023, that world we live in today, we're now in the age of generative AI. I know you've all heard lots of talk about generative AI and chat GPT. Well, what happens if I ask an algorithm to create an image of Gary Kasparov playing chess against a robot? I get this. 
And if you look up a picture of what he looks like today, it is a remarkably good illustration. But you have to look kind of closely. Because if you look up a real photo of Gary Kasparov, you will discover that he does not, in fact, have seven fingers on his right hand. I share the example to inspire you a little bit, but also ground us to say this technology is so new. We need to be cautious about the opportunities and the potential of AI. So as we think about why we need to be cautious, it's not because an algorithm might put too many fingers on an image. That's really not a major risk thing. I actually think about it at a systemic level. And I love, love, love the words of Edward O. Wilson when he says, we have paleolithic brains, medieval institutions, and godlike technologies. It is terrifically dangerous and is now approaching a point of crisis overall. This quote, by the way, 2009, Edward didn't even know where we were going in terms of technology. And one of the biggest challenges that leaders working with emerging and advanced technologies have to do is this idea of medieval institutions, organizations, governments, legislations. And we need to be thinking really critically about how we use technology responsibly. So I'd love to get some input from everyone else here as we kind of get to the last four or five minutes here. As we think about AI next, and, and these are just a handful of examples. I could have listed 50 here. I'd be so curious in Mentimeter where everyone else here gets kind of excited and thinks we'll see some of the biggest impacts of these remarkable technologies that are changing on a day-to-day, week-to-week basis in a way that it is almost difficult to keep up with. So I'll give everyone about 30 seconds here. You can vote for a couple. I certainly have the ones I hope come true. I think that uh, the idea of four-day week work, work weeks is, is wonderful. My team uh, does them summers only, but we do them, and it's wonderful. Um, but I also find uh, humanity, we find a way to fill our time no matter how efficient we get, uh, and I'm sure that many of you can relate to that. So, um, yeah, really interesting to see a, a mostly even split here, and it's probably influenced a bit by your particular area of focus and expertise, but always nice to see how groups of people see the world and, and where the world is headed. So the last topic I wanted to touch on for the last minute or two is this idea of where does corporate and structured innovation fit into this? Uh, as mentioned, I used to run innovation for Mattel, uh, definitely pre-Barbie movie days. In fact, I've not seen it yet, but uh, I'm sure I will at some point. A couple of things that I found were most effective in really getting to the outcomes of an innovation team, organization, or lab. Back to basics. What do your customers and users want? In my earliest days at Mattel, I started a weekly um, webinar, actually, where we presented the insights we got from going into stores and going into uh, partner channels and just talking to people and what we learned. Uh, the first week, I had exactly zero people join the webinar. Uh, by the end of my tenure, this Friday bi-weekly session uh, had over a thousand attendees and our team, while still leading innovation efforts, actually became more of a customer insight department as well. Go and understand what your customers want. Uh, I won't go on about this because we've all heard the cliches, but fail forward, especially in innovation, not every idea is worth pursuing. And if you were to follow the advice of a gentleman named Astro Teller, who is his official job title is captain of moonshots, he works for X, which is part of the Google Alphabet company. Their core way of working is to find the highest risk part of any new idea and test that first. And they aim to fail on 90 plus percent of their ideas. And then finally, a tech forward, not a tech first approach. And they may sound similar, but tech forward means we are open and willing to use technology. To me, tech first means we're going to use technology for the sake of technology. Understand the problem trying to be solved. Understand the customer or organizational value we're trying to drive, and then think about how technology contributes to that. And I found these three ground rules really helped us in building a meaningful innovation program. So the last thing I'll leave you with here before we go to some Q&A, AI never. What are the big picture risks? And Teresa, you did a wonderful job on touching on some of these already in your introduction. We need to be thinking critically about the role of bias and fairness in our systems. If I had another hour, I could show you examples that would terrify you 
in terms of what can happen when bias is allowed to be reflected back or amplified back by an algorithm. We need to really think about the responsible use of AI. Privacy and security, almost not a day goes by where we don't hear about a data breach somewhere. We need to be thinking ahead of the curve within our organizations. How much data about our customers, or about our users, about employees, do we need to connect? What do we anonymize? Um, what is the role of security? And this goes hand in hand with the AI because it's so driven by vast amounts of data. And then finally, a sensitive topic to many, but there will, there are, and there will continue to be workforce impacts to automation and augmentation. I believe organizations where there are significant impacts would be remiss not to be thinking about those proactively, with that foresight mindset to say, when do we communicate to our employees? When do we communicate to our labor force about our position on AI? And that position may not be to say there will be no job losses. The position may have to do with retraining, upskilling, retooling, uh, the changing of roles, or maybe there will be job losses. And I think it is short-sighted to say, no, we will never eliminate jobs due to AI. But again, having those conversations both internally and with the workforce, this is a really important thing. And all of those are sort of part of that treading carefully in the use of this incredibly powerful but unknown kind of technology, sort of this idea of playing with fire in a way. So with that, I'm going to leave you with this quote here, and we'll go into Q&A, but this is from an incredible leader in, in the world of AI, a borderline celebrity as far as people like me are concerned. AI doesn't have a conscience, but we do. It is our job to ensure that AI is developed and deployed ethically to avoid reinforcing harmful biases. So I'm going to pause there. I'm going to pass it back to Teresa. And I think we've got a couple of minutes for some Q&A. Thank you, Rami. That was um, a, a great journey through some of the different ways of thinking about um, how to be innovative and uh, as well as kind of um, understanding a bit more about the role that AI can play in the future of our organizations. And I am happy to share some of the questions uh, that are coming in or that people are thinking about. Um, you touched on uh, the future of jobs and there's a question about um, what are your thoughts about job losses versus jobs being enhanced by AI? I believe that there are a lot of jobs that will change over the next decade. But I believe it is, I believe we're deluding ourselves if we say or pretend that there won't be any job losses. Every once in a while, I'll see something about, oh, you know, this organization is going to take their call center and train them in, in new skills. And that's amazing, but that will not be 100% effective. You could look at parallels in other industries. You could look at parallels in manufacturing where robotics automation has already displaced many jobs over the past decades. You could look at industries like mining and other, he other heavy industries. So I think the most important thing is getting ahead of it versus trying to predict exactly what will happen. But I do not doubt for a second that almost every one of our jobs, especially knowledge workers, will be shaped and influenced by artificial intelligence in some way. Thank you for that. And we have a question from Phil. Of course, many of the attendees here uh, plan and execute events for their organizations. And Phil's wondering about how do you think AI will affect um, how event management is executed? Any insights there? Interesting. I've never thought of that. And uh, for for context, I have I've actually run events. I used to do a lot of work with an organization called TED. I've run both events with TED directly and then run local TEDx events, uh, not just where I live, but in a few countries. Uh, I do think there's a lot of areas for kind of that superficial AI. And what I mean by superficial is co-pilot kind of like use chat GPT or Bard or Claude to get quick answers to things. But I don't think that's transformational. Uh, I have seen the idea of putting an AI as a presenter, as a, at an event. It's usually kind of just for show. On the real management side of events, I don't know exactly what that transformation, I've just never really given it thought. And I bet you if I spent a half hour reflecting on that, I could probably come up with a few examples or maybe ask chat GPT. Uh, but I do think that productivity gains for 
each and every one of us will will be a big part of it. Even things as simple as writing better copy for for bios and for session descriptions and automating some of that. They're little productivity hats, but I don't know that they're really transformational um, in the same way. Great, thank you so much. And uh, I know we've been playing around a bit with the AI as it relates to events. So this might be a, a follow-up to the session. Uh, we have a question from Jeff wondering about um, weaponization of AI. So specifically in the context of foresight, do you foresee the weaponization of AI to exert control or reduce freedoms of the general population? I might almost separate those two. I do think we are seeing many examples, or not seeing them, but they're happening, of the term these days is bad actors using technologies. Um, just today, uh, whether it works or not, we'll see. But X, aka Twitter, announced that to post, you have to pay $1 per year, which is basically a nominal fee, to have an account that posts. But it's a way to validate somewhat that you are a human and not a bot. But it feels like an arms race, right? Because we've got Twitter literally doesn't even know how many of its hundreds of millions, if not billions of users are bots versus how many are real. And it feels like we're always playing catch up. So I think it's already happened. Uh, this idea of misinformation, we're living in an awful time as of you know a week and a half ago with what's going on in the Middle East. Um, misinformation, uh, all of those topics, they're awful. And the unfortunate thing, is that there isn't an easy answer. Uh, I'll give you an example. And, and it, it's a counterpoint to what she said, but I, I listened to an interview with Margaret Atwood recently, and she's a wonderful, inspiring author and amazing and Canadian. But she had an overly simplistic view on how to fix the exact problem. She said, well, if all we have to do is make sure that generative AI rule, uh, systems label their outputs as created by AI. Well, that's an opt-in, right? that doesn't prevent someone else from creating their own tools. In fact, the, the Canadian government just released, uh, what, two weeks ago, its new policies on the use of AI. And they're not real legislation. They're opt-in optional sets of rules. They're kind of like, if you agree with this, you can sign on to this commitment, but that doesn't hold to account those who wouldn't agree with it. So unfortunately, the short answer, which it's too late for a short answer, I've already rambled on and I apologize, but the short answer is, I actually think it's going to get worse before it gets better. And I think it's up to civil business and, and other leaders out there to think about the role of responsible AI in their organization. But it's going to, it it's an, it's an uphill battle, I think, because the technology is insanely powerful and we're just at the cusp of discovering how powerful a candidate will be. What a Thank downer you. kind of answer. Sorry for that, Jeff. That's uh, a bit pessimistic. Um, but uh, I think that what I took away, of course, is how powerful it can be, and thus, you know, there's a lot that we need to think about uh, when using it. We do have a couple more questions coming in, but Rami, I'm a, I'm aware you have a two o'clock appointment you need to get to. Is that right? I'm, I've got another 10, 15 minutes. It's just a dentist appointment. I'm great. Okay, you're okay, rushing me. Uh, uh, thank you to those who are continuing to stay with us. If you're interested in some of the questions that are still coming in or have some of yours, and thank you, Rami, for your bit of extra time. Um, there's a question about, um, would you, with foresight methods, would you recommend to spark internal corporate conversations about the future of AI within an organization? And that comes to us from Emma. Absolutely. I spend a good, good chunk of my time doing exactly that. Um, I will say, I'm going to share you very briefly, my first ever foresight workshop and what a, an amazing success and equal failure it was. I ran a workshop for an organization in BC. Um, I did it for free because it was, it was a new content. This was about 10 years ago. I was getting to this idea of foresight uh, and, and the potential it offered. Ran this workshop with, with the head of product and his his team. And uh, the only thing I asked of him, and I've done other work with him, I said, I want to test some content with you. I'll do a free workshop for your team. Great. Afterwards, I said, the only thing I want is half hour feedback from you. And he said, that was a wonderful, fun workshop. Thank you for doing it. It was great and a complete waste of time. And I was like, okay, you have to tell me more. You said it was great and it was a waste of time. 
we did it with the wrong level. We did it with a team of product managers. And while it's wonderful for product managers to think about the five, 10 year time horizon of their industry, that can't happen without the leadership of an organization thinking on that time horizon too. So the immediate outcome of that was saying, can you come do that rather than my team down? Can you do it with basically my peers and up? And we ran a sort of more of an executive session. It doesn't always have to be there. It doesn't have to start from the top, but having leadership and even in, in many cases of the work I do, boards of directors thinking on that five, 10 year time horizon has a really powerful cascade down effect. Doesn't mean you can't work with contributors and, and product and you know uh, marketing and whatever teams within an organization to think about this. But I do find there's a lot of more impact with sort of that, that senior level leadership uh, perspective. Thank you. And you had one of your thought prompts relate to different how different industries might be impacted by AI. And I touched on a number of organizations you've worked with. Uh, there's a question from Hannah wondering about customization of your content. So um, in, are you able to tailor uh, your presentations to the client or the audience in the room to address their specific industry and how AI might affect it? Yeah, absolutely. It, it's actually why I do what I do because I'm a, just a big nerd who likes learning about new things. So uh, as an example, about a year ago, I started working with a mining company. I knew and probably continue to know nothing about mining, but got to learn a ton about it. And by the way, mining is basically the same as it was 40,000 years ago. Put some dynamite in the ground, blow it up and see what comes out and then melt that down. Um, it, it's changed a little bit, but the core of it is pretty much the same. Um, I've worked in a, a wide range of industries right now, a lot of work in healthcare, in heavy manufacturing, in a lot in financial services, and then uh, previously in, in mining and retail. I think that's what drives me, to be honest, and it's why I don't have a, a real job per se, is because I just, uh, I find it so interesting to learn about other industries and find ways to contextualize content that's meaningful in that way. I will also say there's a lot of incredibly interesting outcomes when you look at adjacent industries. Um, and what I mean by that is sometimes looking at, hey, how is this technology impacting not our direct competitors, but companies that might be up or down the, the value stream from us or in adjacent industry that are non-competitive. And I think I try to bring that thinking in as well, instead of saying just if you're a company, okay, I'm looking at my telescope right now. If you're a company that makes telescopes, let's only look at telescopes. It's kind of a bad example. It's a bit too narrow, but I think it is really powerful to look a little bit outside your walls too. And I try to bring that into my sessions. Thank you for that. Um... I'm laughing to myself because it, in my head, I'm thinking about Taylor Swift and her impact on the NFL and that we did not see that coming is how it might impact an, an industry, but. And I, I'm a secret Swifty, but um, we could have a whole separate <laughs> chat. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Rami, for this insight and for, to use your analogy, opening the door uh, to some of what we need to think about with AI, uh, having a four-set mindset and uh, encouraging innovation within our organizations. You've given us some steps that we can take and uh, appreciate the interaction and engagement from our audience. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, as touched on, we will share a copy of the recording to everyone who RSVP'd and uh, some of the resources that have been referenced in today's session. And we'll be sure to invite you to future sessions. We are here to help with any of your speaker programming. Feel free to reach out anytime. Uh, take care, everyone. Thank you.